Okay, hi everybody, this is John Snyzen here. And today we're doing a special interview and uh, as a request from a lot of our uh, listeners and viewers, uh, we are actually gonna do a special uh, report with uh, David Morgan uh, of uh, the Morgan Report. And uh, very excited because I'm gonna bring you some of the questions that our viewers uh, and listeners have. Uh, so they're, they're pretty excited as well, hearing to, you know, see, seeing what's going on in the silver and the precious metals world. There's tons of things happening there. So we're going to go into all that. But before that, you know, for those of you that don't know David Morgan, he's a widely recognized analyst in the precious metals industry and consult uh, for hedge funds, high net worth investors, mining companies, uh, depositories, and bullion dealers. He uh, is the publisher of the Morgan Report, uh, a world-class publication designed to build and secure wealth. Uh, he's the author of the Silver Manifesto and a future speaker in, at uh, investment conferences worldwide. And I have the pleasure to see you at a couple of conferences speaking, which is really uh, awesome. Uh, he is, uh, his ideas are expressed uh, in the movie, The Force Horseman, uh, a future documentary, watch the full length uh, below and we're gonna leave all the, uh, all, all the stuff uh, down below. And of course you've been featured on all the mainstream medias uh, in the business world that's out there like CBC, CNBC, Fox News, Yahoo uh, Finance, MSB, NBC, BNN in Canada, and, uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, future, all, all the d different uh, fans, you know, magazines out there that talk about uh, mainstream publications because it's a little bit different right. than what uh, we talk about. But uh, And of course, you've been a fantastic educator for many years, David. Uh, so it's a pleasure having you on. John, it's good to be with you. It's uh, nice to connect with Canada again. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's been a while. I, last time I saw you, actually, was, uh, where was that now? I think it was in Spokane, actually, uh, your hometown there when we had the Red Pill Expo with uh, Jared Griffin. I think, uh, was that last time I... Uh, about they have been, yeah. yeah. I mean, I the last Anarchapoco I did, I think, was two or maybe even three years ago. I remember yeah. seeing Josh down there, but I don't think you were with him on that one. I think it was the 2019 one, actually. What, were you with okay. the 2019 one? Yeah. So okay, so, so that yeah. would be the last time I saw it then, <laughs> yeah. which is a nice place. You know, it's uh, it's all good to be down there. Uh, it, you know, there's so much things happening. So it's, it's hard to like, for me to like, try to figure out like, where are we going to start David, uh, yeah. with all the insanity that's going on right now, uh, with, uh, with COVID with, uh, especially with, you know, uh, markets that's going on. Uh, but I have a, I have a few questions and, uh, I, I just wanted to like start a little bit lightly and then we'll go into, uh, some of the other questions, but, um, how much, uh, will the demand for silver, you know? think uh, that you're going to have increase over the next uh, couple of years? Yeah, that's a great place to start, John. So, you know, I'm kind of known and like Mike Maloney as well, that, you know, to get a good clear picture where we're going in the future, it's really good to take a strong, hard, objective look back. In other words, look back in the history and that will could help you see forward. And I believe that. So going back one year, 2020, there's about two or three things that are absolutely, in my view, imperative to understand about the silver market that will hopefully give us some kind of insight into where we go from here. So number one of last year was in early 2020, I think January, at the uh, Davos, which is the town where the World Economic Forum meets. There was uh, a lot going on there, as there is every year. A lot of it's held close to the vest. Uh, lots of commentary in our sphere about Davos. But there was an interview by uh, Bloomberg interviewing a guy that was, I think, the CIO, Chief Investment Officer for Guggenheim. And they asked him what was his conviction trade for 2020. Remember, this was very early in 2020. And he said, silver. And uh, one of the Bloomberg interviewers or two of them almost fell off his seat. That's my color. But it, it rocked him back. You could tell from his body language. And he said, silver, why not gold? And Scott said, well, silver is off about 60%, whereas gold's pretty near its all-time high. And he prefaced that with a lot of information about how we basically go from one bubble to, to another bubble to another bubble. I won't digress and go into it too much, but by the time... He went through that and, he, and it was almost 
and I hope he doesn't mind me saying it. It'd be like interviewing me about, you know, what's wrong with the economy. I mean, he's really gut level honest, spoke the truth. So now he's on silver, it's his conviction trade. And the Bloomberg guy asked him a second question. It says, do you think it can do what the non-precious metals did? Which actually what he meant was, do you think it can do what palladium did? Which is basically go parabolic. And Scott said, I don't want to misquote it, but I think he said it's very likely or it's likely something like that. So that sets the scene for 2020. So that's what uh, the CIO of Guggenheim said. So what happened? Words are words, right? Well, John, you may be pleased to know that the amount of silver that went into the ETFs in 2020 set a record. Nothing ever close to the amount of silver going into the ETFs was ever established like what happened in 2020. According to an early release by the Silver Institute, I'm not making this up, I'm not taking it out of the air, you can verify what I'm about to tell you, is over 300 million ounces went into the silver ETFs in 2020. Was that 100% Guggenheim? No, I doubt it. But was it 50%? I don't know. What I do know is what he said. What I also know is how much uh, silver went into the exchange traded products that was unprecedented. You never saw that kind of investment demand for the silver markets, the commercial bar market, the way the silver price is set. Then on top of that, you got to look at the coins and bars that we talk about as, you know, retail investors. And that would be, uh, you know, 100 million ounces would be a big year. It was approximately 200 million ounces, according to the Silver Institute. So if you add those two together, John, you've got five hundred, roughly round numbers, 500 million ounces of investment demand for silver in 2020. So now I've looked back one year real hard and discuss what we saw and what we know. And now we want to go forward from here. Well, the main problem with the precious metals is education. Most people, the old adage, and I am going to digress, forgive me, people who listen to me before know I do it often, but I used to come back to the point. And there's an adage that once the ship has sunk, everyone knows how it might have been saved. And that's what's going to happen in the precious metals. Once the currency system blows apart, uh, and if that occurs before they're able to establish a reset or move everybody into the Fed coin or a central bank digital currency, which is their goal and which is most likely to happen. But in this thought experiment, let's say that it doesn't happen or there's a disruption or something occurs that the computers freeze or whatever. The point I'm making is once this transition takes place and the metals get a paper price established that's more or less free market, Everyone will see that and realize, oh, oh if, what if only I had bought a little bit of silver? What if only I own one ounce of gold? What if only I bought Bitcoin in you know nine years ago? It's going to be one of those kind of moments in my view. Again, we could look at it as an analogy or a metaphor. It doesn't necessarily come true, but that's the general idea. So going forward, if we have the same demand in 2021 that we had in 2020, then I think we're going to have to see higher prices. And I've already said 40 uh, conservatively for 2021. And we could get to 50, depending on what happens. And I want to circle back that famous expression of the White House press secretary. <laughs> circle back to the fact that the main thing holding back the precious metals is education. And now what happened with this Wall Street bets, where a lot of the investors in the public that were basically just riding along with the sing song stuff that comes out of the mainstream financial press realize that these games are pretty rigged and the little guy really is taken advantage of and the wall street bets with the gamestop situation really opened up the eyes so what happened some of those brought broke off into a subgroup called wall street silver and this is an awareness that's required to get more people into the market because if people could see the future or know where we're going, I mean, John, you've done an excellent job through the years explaining it. I've explained it. Mike Maloney's explained it. But we're in an echo chamber. You know, it's not something, even when I'm on BNN or, you know, one of the main uh, stations, I don't get to express the whole picture like I do here. It's a soundbite thing, you know. Yeah. Where's silver going next week? Does it, does it peak? You know, it's those kind of questions. Once I answer, I'm happy to get the publicity. But it's really not valuable to the audience. Like, oh, David thinks it's peaked now. You know, well, they might have asked me 
if I think it's peak for the month and maybe I do think it's peak for the month, you know? So they turn off the TV set and said, yeah. Oh, that guy really knows what he's talking about. Silver went down from, you know, 26 to 24. Anyway, I digress again, but education, and this is what's happening in wall street, uh, silver, they are getting the word out to people that need it the most. And that's the, the younger generation because they are going to have to pay the biggest price for the, let's say less than honest, approach to the money supply that has taken place over the last 40 years or more yeah 100 the, the the monetary supply has just increased uh, so rapidly and it, no matter what country you look at you are up uh, last time i looked i think we were up like 400 to 800 percent depending on the country uh over like since 2008 and that was i think 2018 19 we're probably up like now it, i think was it this year like m2 or m1 uh, in the U.S. skyrocketed like 70, I think it was M1 skyrocketed 70%. Uh, now that is just not cash, of course, circulating out into the economy. That is the central bank, you know, bailing out uh, the institutions and then having, you know, them deposit, uh, you know, well, they deposit cash for them, for those assets on their, their central banks, uh, no, the bank, central bank uh, deposits. Uh, so it's not necessarily that a movie moves into the economy, but what they can do with it, they, they could leverage it, you know, and that's what we've seen, you know, into the stock market. Margin debt is at record highs right now, if I'm not mistaken, David. Uh, and uh, you're seeing real estate markets in the U.S. are starting to skyrocket again, you know, all, all across the board. A lot of uh, a lot of the usual suspects, of course. Uh, and then, of course, you got uh, New York and uh, several places in, in California where there's you know, uh, not even livable, you know, places. You can't even afford to live there anymore. And there's a growing homeless population. Those are symptoms, you know, of that monetary manipulation. And, and people don't get that, you know, the, the, we're trying to like put out, oh, we got to fix it with a government, uh, you know, a regulation or something, come in there and, and step in and trying to help these people. Meanwhile, it's like, if the government did nothing, if they didn't print all this money uh, to get it with the banks, <laughs> will be uh, a lot uh, easier for people to live and and uh, think about you know back in the day you, you lived long enough that you can remember you know the day where people uh didn't have to have two jobs to you know survive right. uh, yeah and, and and that is you know the the blatant uh malfunction that the government and and the central banks have done uh of mismanaging the monetary supply <laughs> of the of the medium of exchange which you know if you read a little bit of history, you know, they always do that. Uh, I, I was going to get into uh, another thing. We've kind of, you kind of a little bit talked about it, uh, but the divergence that I've seen, I don't know how it is in the United States right now uh, at a lot of uh, bullion dealers, uh, but I follow the Canadian ones. Uh, the major one here uh, that I follow that I use all the time is silvergoldbull.com. Uh, they have about $10 premium right now on you know most one ounce bullion not that i buy uh that always but you know that when i looked at it, it's like oh wow it's uh it was as high as 12 but now it's down at 10 again but usually it's been like three to four uh, you know this is i'm talking about the canadian maple leaf here uh so if if you could give our listeners a little bit of an insight on what do you think about like is there's gonna is there gonna be a constant you know divergence and it's is it gonna go higher that diversion from the spot price you know the paper price versus actual getting physical metal in the in the stores john that's a great question it's one that comes up often because especially new investors into the precious metals look and, you know, they see silver and it's like you said, maybe $10 over the listed paper price for silver in uh, New York yeah. or the world market, basically. And they say, why you know, I'm buying silver. Why should it be $10 more than this price? There's really two parts to the answer. One is the silver market is the commercial bar market. It's not the silver coin market. So if you take a silver bar, you transport it to a, uh, a mint, they melt it down, they put a little copper with it. They then cool it off, they extrude it into a big sheet that's the right uh, thickness exactly for a silver coin. Then they punch it and then they roll the edge and then they put it in a die with the, uh, you know, the queen on one side and the uh, maple on the other, and they press it out and then they polish it and then they put it in a tube and all this stuff takes time, energy, money, effort, et cetera. So 
it's very normal for a silver bar, the silver market, to be turned into the silver coin market. And with all that I just described, I think anyone that can think, and that's anybody listening to your program, knows that that's going to cost perhaps $2 Canadian, maybe 3 to do all that, to turn that silver bar into a silver coin. So that's part of it. The other part is, well, okay, David, you just explain maybe it's 2 or $3 Canadian. Why am I not paying 2 or $3 over the silver bar price? And the answer is demand there is basically what you could call a shortage in retail product. So like anything at an auction, the highest bidder gets the, gets the item. And right now the mints are behind the demand in all countries, basically, some less than others. And that's the reason. Now the best question or the best part of the question, John, is will that sustain or not? First of all, again, I got to go backwards. We had the same situation back in the 2008 financial crisis. There was a huge demand for silver, both wholesale and retail. And I wrote an article about arbitrage and how long it would last and that the spread would get back to normal. And unfortunately, a lot of people wanted me to say that the silver commercial bar price would come up and meet closer to the coin price. And I said, no. Right now, there's enough silver bars, silver commercial bars, that the price will come off on the coin market down into the regular silver price, and the premium or the spread will be more normal, like three, four dollars a coin for government coins, and then usually the spread on a privately minted coin depends how many you buy, depends on where you find them. You know, general rule of thumb: look at make two, two and a half uh, dollars premium. So. I don't know if it's going to continue or not. What I do know is it's not letting up. I do know that there's a premium on commercial bars that I've never seen before. And the premium is not astronomical. It's somewhere, depends who you talk to, what uh, dealer you speak with, uh, what wholesaler you have contact with, but it's somewhere in the minimum of 25 cents, maybe 50 cents, just to change the ownership tag on that bar sitting in the warehouse. So if uh, I own one contract, I own five 1,000 ounce bars, I sell them to you, John, you see, and we do the deal, then they take my name off those five bars and they put a sticker on with your name on it. It's all done by computer, basically. Yep. So that would be 25, 30, 40 cents. However, if you said, hey, I'm buying those bars from you, David, and I'm going to load them out, I'm going to come down with my truck, I'm going to take them. Now you're talking around a buck or buck, maybe even more than a dollar, because there's fees involved to take it off the exchange. Someone's got to walk over, find those bars, match the uh, serial number, verify the weight, blah, 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 and, and outload those bars. So, you know, I was miss, uh, I was... Um, just, I was asked, you know, hey, David, you're wrong, you know, on your numbers. And I'm, no, I'm not wrong on my numbers. It depends. I was speaking about taking off, off delivery. In other words, taking the physical yep. home with you. And that's more like a dollar an ounce on a commercial bar. Never heard of John. Normally it's just a few pennies. And if you're an Eric Sprott and you're buying for the SLV or the, excuse me, the yeah, PSLV, uh, you're talking, you know, really small. I mean, two cents, you know, I mean, nothing basically, but uh, not anymore. Now, I'm not saying he's going to have to pay 25 cents. I'm not saying that. Uh, it varies with the quantity. It varies with the dealer. It varies with the uh, supply and demand. But I will say this. I'll put my neck out there. I've done that a few times in my life. I wouldn't be shocked that as the PSLV uh, goes through another shelf offering and perhaps buys a lot more physical over the next year or two, that their average price above the physical spot price is not substantially higher than it used to be. Uh, I just want to digress one more time. There's a dealer, I won't name him, that is in Arizona, so that kind of gives it away, but most people will know what the heck I'm talking about. He said, I'm paying 10 times as much for my silver. Well, that really, really is misleading in my strong opinion, because what he was saying is I pay about five cents over for a commercial bar, and now I'm paying 50 cents over for a commercial bar, right? Yeah. 
Well, anyone in Canada would love to pay 50 cents over for a Canadian maple, right? But if you take a nickel and you multiply it by 10, it's 50 cents. But the way he said it to me just is very, um, I just don't like it. I, th I think it's very misleading is what I think. So anyway, hopefully I covered that, beat it to death. But if not, ask me again or reframe it because that's the big, big picture on why you have to pay so much. Again, I'll repeat the, the most important part. It could be where we have such demand that it does move let's say in the middle where there's a premium on thousands, as I just alluded to, that may continue. So anything physical, whether it's commercial or not commercial, is going to have a premium on it. The only thing that won't is this fake paper paradigm yeah. that can be, because what are you getting? You're getting a piece of paper. That's what you're getting. I mean, you know, you got to know that. I mean, I'm not against the free market. If you want to buy uh, a piece of paper, a stock, because all the ETFs are stocks. I mean, you're buying a commodity, but what you get is a stock certificate. Yeah. So no, anyway, uh, back to you. Yeah, it, it definitely is, and it, it's similar to having your, you know, thinking that your money is yours if you deposit it into your bank account. Yeah. And it's uh, similar to for crypto people that have their money at their exchanges if they don't hold their private key. You know, it's not yours. It, it's very similar concepts uh, for for all of them. And, and as long as you can't, you know, physically hold it itself, and especially with uh, SLV and GLD, you know, there's uh, uh, and there's a, a couple other ones. I had a guy. Uh, contact me about Bank of Montreal apparently and their uh, programs that they had as well. And he actually was exited out of that program apparently um, uh, as well, you know, here in Canada because they, you know, he, he tried to actually like get his physical uh, metal and he couldn't get it. They didn't have it. So uh, it's pretty obvious uh, that, you know, they, and, and you know, it's, it's a, a thousand, about thousand something year old scam you know they've been going on forever with these types of scams where they you know custodial uh, had custodial you know silver or gold and then they uh, started lending out a little bit of paper and so on and, and then you know over time there's more and more and more and then uh, people find out about it and i think we're getting pretty close you know there's been so much talk about it uh you know over the last decade uh, uh david you know by so many uh, great people like Mike Maloney, uh, SGT Report, there's been SD, like all these people have been talking about it forever, you know, the, uh, the lack of integrity uh, in these markets. So uh, I, I actually had another thought and, you know, I, I just checked the, the current gold to silver ratio, for example, uh, and it's, it's an, not close yet to, you know, the, the bottom, if you can call it, where it actually, you know, a lot of times it's, uh, uh, you know, round 20, you know, it likes to bottom out when it actually fully corrected. Uh, so like looking at that, like right now it's at 65, I think the highest. Yeah. So this is the spot price again, again, but that's how you measure it. Uh, and it was like 120 something, I believe, wasn't it uh, at the peak of it? So how low do you think that could go? Like, do you think they'll try to manipulate it somehow? Uh, or do you think it'll correct even the paper price as well? Uh, looking at the gold server ratio. Yeah, I think it'll. I think it'll get to the historic ratio for money, which is sixteen to one, yep. and it could get to the natural ratio of how it comes out of the ground, which is less than ten to one. Uh, I actually wrote an article about that. One of the first ones I wrote for the public domain. I don't know if it's still on the web or not. It's probably on my website. It's called "Engineering the Price of Gold." It's a very quick read. People want to know, well, what's the correct price of gold? How many dollars, you know, how many dollars an ounce should gold be worth? And that's a very, very simple arithmetic problem. What you do is you take the uh, the M0, basically the currency supply, base money, excuse me, or base currency. <laughs> Mike Maloney will call me up. Yeah. <laughs> base currency, and and you divide it by ounces of gold. So if you did that, and I wrote this about 2003, so the base currency divided by uh, 165 million ounces of gold, is it or 265, I don't even remember. I think it's 265 million ounces of gold. It came out to 2,500 an ounce. So that's it. How many dollars are in circulation divided by how much gold the U.S. has? The U.S. price of gold will be 2,500 an ounce. That was like 17, 18 years ago. If you do that same arithmetic today, you're over 8,000 an ounce. 
as you said, from I forget what their starting point was. I think you said 2008, we're up 400 percent in our money supply. So if you take 2,500 and multiply by 400 percent, it's 10,000. And then I know the numbers at least eight, if not more like 10. You can do the math; it's arithmetic. So that's the cost. That's the price of gold per ounce in theory, and that's hard currency. Remember, gold is a physical item; it's trusted as money worldwide for thousands of years. But that's not all the credit in the system. And I'm not against credit, by the way. But that is how many, you know, physical, you know, what we call dollars there are backed by gold. That's what it means. And that's yeah. the that's the cash equivalent of the economy. That's not the whole economy. No, that's, that's not the M3, gold represent. M2 or M3, exactly. Yeah. If you right. calculate so, it in that, the price would be yeah. insane. Go oh, crazy. 40, yeah. 50,000. It was yeah. too nuts. So now what I did with that basis, going back to 2,500 an ounce, I said, well, what's the price of silver? And I said, well, that's hard to calculate. Why? Because no one treats silver as money anymore. I mean, I do, some people do. The word silver means yeah. money in all the romance languages, but nonetheless, <laughs> even though it's an expression, you know, that we use cross by palms with silver, which you probably don't hear, but at my age, you used to. Uh, so I said, it could do what it did in 1980, which is get to the historic ratio of 16 to one. It did that in 1980 when silver hit 50, gold 850, the ratio came to about 16 to one. It wasn't very long, but it did hit it. And I think it could do it again. And then I went on to say what I just said a moment ago that in an extreme overshoot, and I don't know if it'd be an overshoot, but in an extreme um, recognition of how valuable and how precious these metals really are and how they are protecting your wealth. When we get to that point, 1% or 2% of the population wakes up to that fact, we could see a ratio of 10 to 1. I don't know. I will say this, um, and I haven't said on many shows, not this big news, but uh, I got to know a little bit about the uh, Hunt Brothers um, trust uh, people. and. Uh, and also got it, I think, from Jerome Smith in one of his books. But the Hunts felt the correct ratio is five to one. That doesn't mean it's going to be five to one. It doesn't mean it's ever going to be five to one. But I thought it was interesting because it was kind of like getting the inside track of one of the biggest silver bulls of all time, you know, Bunky and Herbert Hunt, to, well, what do you guys think? It's like, yeah, we think five to one is about the correct ratio. <laughs> no, it's not out of the picture. Like, to me... I, I think there could be a total panic because I, I look at, you know, the, the whole cashless thing. And I, uh, I did a presentation in Acapulco last, was it last year? Yeah. Right before the craziness uh, hit us. And uh, at that time I, I went into, you know, the, the whole cashless drive and there's actually been already cashless uh, currency and, and that was in uh, Ecuador. Ecuador had it from 2014. I don't know if you're familiar with this, uh, David, but it a little was, bit. Uh, yeah, from 2014 and it uh, failed. They just closed the project by 2018 because there was no adoption. And and hopefully, you know, we could educate enough people that we don't adopt the, uh, you know, the right. fake, uh, uh, the fake uh, funny money that, you know, we can have a direct uh, <laughs> deposit account at the Federal Reserve or at the Bank of Canada, however they want to set it up. Uh, but I, I think that people will recognize this. And I, uh, if you go and look at Venezuela right now, you know, Venezuela is very interesting because they had a hyperinflation, I think, back in the 90s, they had one. Uh, and then they had another one now, uh, which the currency was called uh, Bolivar's Fuerte. Uh, and that one failed in 2018. So they created a new one. Oh, actually, in between, they tried to create the uh, cryptocurrency called Petrodollar, right. which was supposed That's to right. be backed by oil that one failed mr roller because nobody trusts you know uh, the government and then now the the subarano which is the replacement of the ferrete is hyperinflating as we speak you know they're printing uh, one million uh bolivar notes <laughs> so, you know the p and that just shows you you know, people are not trusting the new currency that are coming into supply by the government and, and, and you know it's stupid by the government you know like why would they think that they could trick the people right back into another uh, currency that just failed like it's it's exactly the same damn currency a and uh it just shows because trust is everything when it comes to currency and i like from studying uh currencies and hyperinflations you know when that link of trust breaks that's usually when like it starts and then it takes less than a year usually for it to end 
you know, when people stop using the currency and does not trust it as a medium of exchange because, you know, why would I use it as a medium of exchange when it loses value so rapidly? Uh, and the government then has to just print X amount to cover their budget or, or do whatever. And then you get uh, usually hyperinflation. Uh, so I, I, I find that the trust link is the number one key of any value of any currency. It doesn't matter if it was Bitcoin or if it was gold and silver. People just blatantly distrusted it. You know, it, it wouldn't be worth much, right? So uh, what is your thoughts on that? You know, like the trust aspect to currencies. Yeah, it's all, I did an article called dollar.com. And then the subtitle really was dollar.con because it's all a confidence game. I mean, a con yep. artist is a confidence man or woman. Yep. They gain your confidence and we've had our confidence. I want to add on to that a little bit because you brought to mind, did an excellent job, by the way. I'll try to send you the link, John, something I did a long time ago. I hopefully can dig it out of YouTube. But I did a video of someone else. It was a display case of the Zimbabwe currency. <laughs> and I think it was 18 months. And it goes something like this. Don't quote me. I'll find the video and hopefully you can put it in the show notes. But it started off where one Zim, Zim dollar equaled one U.S. dollar. And then, you know, the inflation started and I'm just going to make up the numbers. But, you know, after six months, it was, you know, 150,000 Zim dollars equaled one U.S. dollar. And then it was 250 and then 500. And then they got to trillions. And then the uh, last note, let me dig it out. I'll be a little shaky on camera here. Yeah, but, I do uh, have that one uh, at home, by the way. I have the whole well, uh, there's the, uh, currency set. There's the 50 trillion. Yeah. Okay. 50 <laughs> trillion actually circulated. Okay. What people don't know is that the 50 trillion was the last one to circulate. The next one up was double. The next printing just doubled the 50 trillion to 100 trillion. This note never made it into circulation. Yeah, that's how bad it was. It, yeah, it, it, it's, it's it was insane. so bad that the 50 trillion was it. And then when the 100 trillions got there, they had already reset the currency. Yeah. Did you actually know that that 100 trillion uh, Zim note is actually like raised in value now? Because what Zimbabwe did, they uh, they asked their population to, you know, can you give in all your old Zim dollars that you have on you? And we'll give you, I think it was like 47 billion uh, is one dollar or something it was. I don't, don't quote me on that, but I think it was something similar to that. And uh, a lot of people gave them in and there was a, a severe lack now of the hundred trillion dollar bills, which sucks because, uh, you know, the, the it went from like, I bought like almost a hundred for like $40, but now it's almost $40 for one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I was aware that they were worth 35 to 40 US yeah. and I bought, um, a hundred of them off of eBay and I forget what I paid and I gave those things out. I know. Yes. Right <laughs> oh yeah. I gave a lot of those out during my lectures. I have yeah. just a few left. In fact, I had to dig pretty far to find the one, yeah. but uh, yeah, no, I am aware of that, but it just uh, proves the point of what you said that once this thing catches fire and confidence is lost, it can really yeah. accelerate. I mean, when you think about it, I'm pretty sure I have the number right as far as time. I think it was 18 months, you know, one Zim dollar was equal to one US and 18 months later, a hundred trillion wouldn't buy anything. Yeah, no, exactly. And they, and they waited it. They, you know, they got so far. That's just like, bring a bunch, you know, like they were bundled, right? Then they just throw yeah. in like, well, however many kilos of the 50 trillion. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's how bad it can get and it, of course we saw it in uh venezuela there's been like in the 1900s there was uh, a whole bunch you know i have a great uh currency album that i've been uh collecting slowly to as well and you know th in there there was a whole bunch i have 500 billion uh yugoslavian dinar for example as well you know that was another big one and i had the i had the pleasure to work with a lot of uh, and get to know a lot of people from former yugoslav republic from serbia croatia bosnia and, and so on and they really told me some very interesting stories of you know how uh they actually like what was the best way to survive it's like yeah you know if you had guns if you had your farm uh and you had you know water and food on your farm then you were uh, pretty okay off you know it wasn't great uh but then they said you know the people that had gold and silver they were uh, doing pretty good at the end of it not during but you know at the end of it when 
when things really had uh, you know collapsed it was uh just a bonanza for these people and and they become very wealthy you yeah. know uh during that time because they had the wealth protection the wealth shield that uh, you know gold and silver is throughout history so uh it's it's very interesting and who knows where we're gonna go but i like how are they gonna be able to like fight the forces of history you see more and more people you know now with we were talking at you know the wall street bets people you know seeing that everything is rigged against them i think they were angry at the, their parents losing money in 2008 and now they're coming back they wanted to take on the the stupid hedge funds uh that was out there you know shorting these stocks and um, I think they were just out to get back for, you know, what they did to their parents, because a lot of their parents are still, you know, not not back uh, to where they uh, they were back in 2008. So it's it's pretty devastating. Uh, but I think over history, you know, what happens is, you know, these things has to go its way. And a lot of people's like, no, it's different this time. But when you go and like I, I read a couple of very interesting the history of fiat paper money by um uh what is his name randall something um randall t foster i don't know if you ever read that book but it's a thousand year history all the way back from china the the, the inventors of paper money in 1024 uh, and then all the way and he actually like just go and like every single hyperinflationary story you know everybody was protecting that had a certain thing you know, you know did certain things protected themselves and and there's no way, like, even if we go digital, there's, you know, you could print millions of digital units and uh, it's equally unscarce. <laughs> so it's interesting, uh, Dave. And uh, I, I think that's, you know, where we will go, you know, at one point when uh, they just can't stop manipulating anymore. And I think uh, that comes with, um, uh, yeah, that co- actually brings me to one of the questions here, which is, you know, how do you think with, know their next step because they, they're gonna have to in order to keep this like uh, you know dead system a, a alive they're gonna have to go to ne- some kind of negative interest rates and wh- what do you think that would have as an effect on uh, on precious metals uh, if they go negative interest rate like do you think they could keep this uh, the system going for a couple more years or what, what do you think it's really tough i mean i've yeah. obviously thought about it like you john almost obsessively first of all I'll say i've been writing about the morgan report so i think it's a two-step situation and really i picked this up from uh, bill holter and uh, jim sinclair i think i know what they want they want a cashless system they want everything tracked traced and taxed they want you in their system they want a centralized digital currency that they control called a fed coin that's what they want will that be what they get remains to be determined. My thought is, again, similar to Bill Holter. I, and, you know, Bill may say, well, that's not what I said. But the idea is they will have a failure at what they do. They, you know, one day they say, you know, you've got six months to trade out of your commercial bank account into the Federal Reserve direct deposit account. You know, if you don't know how to do it, we're setting up a concierge service at the post office. All you gray hairs like me that don't know how to work your phone, bring it in, we'll set you up, right? But it'll fail. Like you said, people reject it. They didn't want the Venezuela oil back nonsense. They didn't want, you know. And so based on the non-adoption of it, then I think phase two will be similar, except they'll throw gold in there. Because as you said, and we both know and have studied, it's a confidence game. Yeah. So if they come up with the, well, what we'll do now is every Fed coin is backed by 40% gold or whatever they come yeah. up with. Uh, now they will use that to gain the confidence in the market again. So I think that's where it's going to go. But do I think negative interest rates? Actually, I'm a bit of a lone wolf. I don't think so for the US dollar, but it could. I won't rule it out. And I don't know. But I think when the, the last thing to go, if you look at Exeter's pyramid, and you look at the liquidity squeeze when people start to lose confidence. Well, they're going to lose confidence in the derivatives market. Kiss it goodbye. The county party counterparty risk is so high, you're not going to get paid. Or if you get paid, it's in Zimbabwe, $100 yeah. trillion dollar notes, and they're not going to be able to use them for much. So that's the derivatives go away. Then you're going to see a lot of you know the other options and whatever, both the uh, over-the-counter derivatives market and the mainstream market. 
you're going to move down into like stocks and bonds. A lot of the corporates that are zombie corporations will be recognized as such. So they can't sell their debt at all. So it gets discounted real heavily. So in the extra thought process, the liquidity squeeze goes from, it's an upside down pyramid. It goes from the least uh, liquid, most untrusted financial instruments to the most trusted. So as you work your way down the pyramid, you get into real estate, you get into business, you get into stocks, you get into maybe some corporates are going to be okay. And you get into like the U.S. Treasury market, which is sacrosanct. I mean, now there's nothing purportedly more safe than a you know short-term T-bill. And then that starts to blow up. So then you go into physical cash. And so I think to keep the suckers in the game to the last possible minute and disc gold until they can't do it anymore they will keep a slightly positive interest rate on gold on uh, the dollar us dollar yeah. because that will be the money of last resort so if you're getting negative interest rates through the china central bank the euro central bank any south american currency any australian or british run you know situation like you canadians you australians and you brits you know <clears throat> not all go negative now could the us could I think regardless of whether the U.S. quote unquote dollar goes negative or not, the run to paper will be the great run before the final run to gold. Because at some point, then the paper isn't trusted either short term or long term. The only thing that's trusted before the absolute destruction of the currency will be the run to gold. And then, of course, the run to silver will be probably astronomical because it's a smaller market. It's more affordable. So that's what will happen. Now, as that is occurring, there'll be all kinds of government obfuscation. They'll jawbone it. You know, the dollar strong, it'll always be strong. And, you know, you can only exchange a thousand units for, for gold per day. You can't exchange more than that for gold because gold is anti-American. And, you know, <laughs> who knows what? I'm making it up, but I've studied enough monetary history like you, John, to know. The governments will stop at nothing to lie out of their mouth, look you in the eye and spout nothing but lies to try to keep you in their rigged game yeah. to the very end while they're doing their very best to loot everybody of everything they've got. And that's not an exaggeration. So let me give it back to you and see what your thoughts are on my thing. Yeah, no, I, I think you're pretty spot on. Uh, there's going to be, you know, some chaos coming very soon. And uh, like I, I pointed out, I think it was like late in uh, 2019, I created a report and talked about uh, the collateralized loan obligations uh, that are on the corporate markets. And, and look where corporates are now. Uh, you know, they're all like a whole bunch of zombies. I, I don't know the exact number. Is it like 20 or uh, even more? I think it is. It's more than 20 last yeah. time I looked at it. I want yeah. to interrupt you. But you, it's way up. And that's what they, you know, you know, they don't, I mean, they do creative accounting. I'll just put it in polite yeah. terms. So really, you know, I think if you got down to the honest to God accounting, it's probably more like 40%, but that's a guess. That's my yeah. opinion. Yeah. And, and, and they finalize, uh, financialize everything, right? So now you're seeing just running around desperate for to find any asset to, you know, pump and dump. You know, recently in the crypto markets, you see like the uh, NFT stuff, uh, uh, collectible cards. They're trying to find anything that they could, you know, be able to pump up and uh, as an asset because there's so much, you know, uh, fiat slashing around, slashing around, uh, and they're desperate to try to find something that could protect its value because they know that the value will go down. Uh, and um, I, you know, I looked at, uh, I, I posted on LinkedIn just recently uh, a little uh, tidbit on uh, CDIC, so our form of the FDIC that's in Canada or the F financial claim scheme that's in, I think it's called that both in the UK and Australia. I forgot exactly, but uh, it's basically the deposit insurance. And, and so I looked at their numbers and I pulled up their, you know, consolidated financial statement for 2020. And you know how much cash they had in there? Uh, they had 3,000, uh, no, 3.800 uh, million dollars in cash, like just cash uh, in there. Uh, and they're supposed to cover, I think, 743 something a billion dollars of, of different uh, assets, you know, that they have under the CDSE fund. And uh, so I posted about that. I posted about the percentages and I said, like, well, 
uh, I think it was like 0.0008% that they had in their fund with the actual bonds and everything, the T-bills that they hold in there. Um, and so they actually politely sent me a message back to, <laughs> to remind to that. And they said, uh, yeah, but there's nothing to worry about. We could put as much as $25 billion. Well, that's only four times more. So if you add that in, you know, you're only at 0.0042%. So that's not going to help much. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I also made fun of them for having, uh, literally, if you watch anything, which I don't do too much of because I'll get crazy, oh, mainstream TV and, and radio here, they have CDC, CDIC commercials constantly on. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, it's probably like five to 10 times a day minimum. And uh, they said in, in that comment, because I was making fun of them, they said that, uh, well, it's to create confidence in the population <laughs> that, you know, their, their money is safe. Meanwhile, you know, they basically didn't debunk anything of what I said of the percentages. They said, like, this is what we have in our fund, which you could pull up. Anybody could pull up their balance sheet. So it, it was hilarious. It's uh, it's pretty funny. It's all a confidence game, you know, uh, with these uh, bankers. And uh, I, you know, we saw it actually at the start of the pandemic. We saw issues with cash here in Canada, yeah. by the way. Uh, and there was a lot of people. I actually took out a whole bunch. You know, <laughs> I pulled out like I think as much as ten thousand. They had a really hard time. Um, I wanted just to be an a hole. I wanted uh, like in twenty dollar bills. Okay. Uh, yeah and they were like well we can't do that you know like you don't have that money available like <laughs> i'm just you know and, and then i go into their balance uh, sheet because like uh i asked the ladies like what a, you, you know your consolidated financial statement shows that you have 1.3 percent cash to deposit ratio it's like, well, what the, she got angry at me at that point because she knew what I was talking about. And I was just like, what do you think we are? You know, we're a credit union. <laughs> <laughs> Answer to that. So it, it's pretty interesting. It's all that confidence game. But, you know, people even knew that they could, you know, pull a tiny little bit of money. You know, just 5% of the deposit goes out. That bank is done. Any bank yeah. in Canada basically yeah. is done. Very few have anything above like 5% to cover uh, their assets. So that is what they're worried about. That's why they want that, you know, the cashless system because you can't do a bank run in a cashless system. Right. <laughs> Good luck right. with that. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you're you're basically a slave. You, you don't even know your money anymore. No. Uh, currency, currency, sorry. Yeah, and currency, uh, right. It's uh, no, it's, it's it's very frustrating. I had a really good question from a. I, I know we're getting like I want to finish up here for you, but I have one more question that I wanted to ask before uh, we leave here, uh, and it was uh, about the Basel three and four uh, implications for paper and physical silver and gold valuations and pricing. Uh, can you please explain uh, what's supposed to happen uh, and what you think will happen and and, and how. Uh, to best structure oneself in precious mar uh, uh, metals and, and crypto and other assets to take advantage uh, and protect oneself financially from those uh, uh, movements that have happened there. Uh, Basel III uh, allows gold to be considered a tier one asset, which means it's as good as cash, which of course it's better than cash by yeah. any <laughs> historical means. Four, I'm not familiar with. I'll give that back to you at the end, but the yeah. best way is to hedge. You don't need to go all in and put yourself on a gold standard, but you have to have a partial gold or silver or precious metal standard. What that means is probably 10% is enough for most people. And the best way to exit the banking system, really, in my view, is to write a check to a well-established trusted bullion dealer. So yeah. I'm not one. I don't, you know, I own it. Uh, I recommend it, but I don't, you know, I'm not a sale. I don't, I don't have a bullion dealership. That's not my business. I, I write a financial newsletter. But the point is, you know, if you want to withdraw that, let's say 10,000 Canadian, it's such a pain in the butt to stand in line and ask for 20s and ask if they really have it or not. All that you did, John, you just actually go down and maybe there's a coin dealer in your neighbor, you know, in your city or, you know, Kitco for Canadians and others. I don't want to recommend any certain one. And some banks used to give it. I know I've had horror stories backing up what you said earlier on in this discussion you know i had a friend that had the cert for uh scotia i think it was and he never got his silver either and he had a cert that said it and that really annoys me but i digress to come back you've got to have some precious metals 
On the cryptos, I'm neutral. I think you could have them. I mean, I am associated with the uh, uh, gold and silver backed one. If you're interested to find out more, it's uh, URL. It could be anything these days. It doesn't have to be .com, .net, .tv. It could be .anything. So the URL is AG, the symbol for silver, dot .load, L-O-D-E, dot .one, O-N-E. So it's AG, dot L-O-D-E, dot O-N-E. It's available worldwide. It's a digital-based uh Basically, it's a monetary system yep. and gold, silver, and there will be cryptos coming soon. And what's really nice about it is it does have already a uh, what you call electronic debit card, which I've used. I bought some of my protein supplements using it to test it out. I made about three purchases. That's only on the Internet where you say what's your, you know, what's your uh, debit card number? You type in the numbers and it works. But we are working hard to get it affiliated with a debit or credit card you already have in your wallet yep. which is a company out there and probably more than one that does that so it's already a kyc your bank knows you probably better than you know you <laughs> and <laughs> it will let you adopt your um your digital silver and gold into your uh current um account and you could spend it and that's the only way to really use it in the modern society i mean if you go to your local grocery store with two silver maples the guy might goo and gaw and oh, can i touch him and you know get a really elated but he wouldn't know what to make you change him he wouldn't know how much they're worth should he give you spot of the bid or the offer i mean there's all those things but if you have it on a on a debit card and hand it to him it's between you and the project um you know what the going rate is which you could see instantly yep. and away you go so i think we're moving that way i think that's one of our are we the people, the little guy, the people that are awake and aware and really want to do something, vote with your dollars. And I wouldn't say, look, this is an adjunct to hold in your hand. I want to be very clear here. But I've, I am, and I am involved. I have contributed blocks of silver to get this thing going along with many others. But I believe in it because it's the way that the monetary system is going, except it's precious metals back and it is decentralized. It's not a, a Fed coin. So, so there's that, John. We might end there. I really enjoy speaking yeah. with you. And one of the books of many I've read on the currency debacles is uh, The Penniless Billionaires. That's quite a read also. But I've actually picked up a new one. I forget the author that someone recommended. Some of these books are like 100 or 200 bucks, but I buy them because I could afford them because they're out of print. No one reads this. Oh, no, 100 percent. You know, I'm telling you, it's like all those books that uh, like older books. I, I don't know how many of the history books on money that I bought that has been under $60. You know, there's some that are as much as 200. Actually, I, I do have the IMF special drawing rights ownership manual. I managed to get, get a hold of that one. That one was actually at a uh, somebody had taken it out of a library somewhere. Uh, and it's actually the Treasury Secretary, you know, his handbook on the special rights. <laughs> but that was very expensive. It was $600. Oh. But I, I just had to have it. You know, yep. being a monetary geek, you know, it's, it's, yep. it's hard to pass on opportunities like that uh, when you find them. So uh, a lot of fun there. Uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's got to be very interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I personally, you know, as well, I try to tell people this, you know, I, I hold, you know, I say, you know, the same, you know, 10 is, you know, the, the best opinion, even uh, top people on Wall Street would tell wealthy people to do that. Uh, I personally yeah. have more because I, I do too. know that yeah. it's going to be a blow off uh, top on it. And then you want to be positioned to, you know, transition at one point uh, over and then come back in it again, because, uh, over time, you know, like we always have these cycles, but uh, you know what I really like and what I think we we could go here if we do uh, properly get a distrust in the in the system is we cycle back to what I call decentralization of money again. Right. And that's where, you know, you got guys like the load guys, you know, I met uh, met a bunch of them. Uh, good guys uh, got those projects that are out there uh that you know like again you know it's uh it's all about trust right so do you trust right. them to have enough of the gold or enough of the silver you know depending on the different projects that are out there uh but those are the future you know those type of projects and they're decentralized uh in ways that you know uh, no uh, central entity can control them as much uh any anymore so it's it's way better to me like if we had a free market for money and currency out right. there uh, where people could choose you know it's like oh well, that'd be so hard you know we have like four or five options at the store uh it's like well choose choose whatever you want and and like well, whoever 
the the local grocer you know uh, wants to take you know he doesn't have to take all five he's like well i just want to accept this one yeah. uh so it's pretty simple and the free market will decide you know where yeah. uh, where are we going to go but i i don't think the <laughs> the centralized entities will you know let us do that yet but you know when, when they push it too far you know that trust is going to break for decades uh potentially when you look over history right so uh, when that yeah. happens, you know, that's when you get that break pack to, you know, the, the different projects like load and, and all these other uh, decentralized money and currency projects out there that will take hold because in, in, in U.S. history, there's been, you know, central banks, then decentralized currencies again. Uh, and they've been backed by all kinds of things, you know, tobacco, yeah. uh, cotton and slavery uh, was yeah. one that I, I saw as well. Uh, so they've been backed by anything. Uh, and money can be backed by a lot of different things as long as you have trust in it uh, yeah. and, and it's valuable. So we'll see. And and of course, you know, Bitcoin and crypto as well, you know, is is there, you know, at one point, you know, I know the bankers are really trying to take it over now. Uh, they're really drooling on, you know, getting rid of the pesky Bitcoin. Uh, and, and it was a coordinated attack the other, other time. And it was like, it's so volatile. And the day after, you know, when several central bankers said, <laughs> just drop uh, through the ceiling so it's no it's it's going to be very interesting um dave to see the next uh couple but i i think like now we're entering into that insolvency phase uh in the economy where they shut out shut down the economy i think that they have a little circuit breaker you know <laughs> they can flip back yeah. and, on and right. back and 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 when they get back to normal you know which i don't think they can yeah, I think they're going to just keep on having these, uh, you know, government uh, programs. If you go and look at Canadian TV again, you know, uh, all these government commercials, not only for, you know, like, oh, you got to wash your hands, you got to wear your mask, but they're also like uh, poor, uh, commercials that talk about all these great tax credits uh, that people are get, uh, getting for, you know, like their kids. And it's like, oh, I couldn't have bought my house if it wasn't for the government. <laughs> <laughs> so you listen to those things and I, I like i'm telling you it's like i think the u.s is not going to go first and uh, i think canada and, and my home country norway and so many other countries will go first but i think there's like the the norways uh is just insane like i i just get complaints all the time from my family over there you know they they get salary increases but they're like getting eaten up by far with uh, the inflation that's there so there's you know, a bunch of them that basically live off of real estate and, and Norway is one of them, Canada is one of them, Australia as well. I think Hong Kong, Singapore, I, I, I think a couple more Scandinavian countries and the UK as well. But all of them live off of, uh, you know, their, their uh, um, houses, their asset, you know, that they're going to retire on. But what yeah. if that how? And they do believe seriously. And if you ask realtors, they do believe that, oh, it's never going to go down. Yeah, right. uh, and, and that's what the, the central bankers are trying to do. They're trying to push assets like stocks and, and real estate up. So people think that, you know, everything was okay, but it, it, it's really not. And um, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, I, I think we're getting to the end here, but I wanted to get you uh, to uh, give me insight on one little thing. Uh, and it, it would be like, if, uh, if, if you were to see like where, uh, we're going, what would be your favorite outcome, like your favorite possible outcome that we would see? Because we, we talked about the bad outcomes. What could be potentially like uh, some good outcomes that we could see um, if we're lucky? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd preface it with banks seldom lose, but my wish would be for, um, you know, money's basically power. I mean, you look at our Congress critters and our senators, most are bought and paid for. And that's what you see. And, and it's unfortunate, but most people don't have high enough integrity where they can't be bought. So if money is power, if you buy that premise, then uh, let's get the power back to the people. And the best way to get power back to the people in today's world is basically through a decentralized uh, crypto or hard currency or any alternative. Uh, it doesn't have to be crypto. It doesn't have to be precious metals. It can be um, notes that are credit hours in your home community, yep. but take the power back to the people where we decide what money is. And you said it yourself, John, a moment ago, and that's the best way to go. And that would be my ultimate outcome. Let's get rid of the banksters once and for all. Yep. Let's get back where we, you know, look each other in the eye, do everything we say we're going to do, live a much simpler life as far as rules and regulations. You don't have to have these manuals that are 
you know, 1800 pages and there's 30 of them on the bookshelf telling us everything you can't do or think or say or write or any broadcast, whatever. So <clears throat> I think it's like any of the books that you and I have read at the end of the great inflations, there's a huge upheaval in the society. There is a reset that's an overused yep. word, but it's true. And how it comes out is yet to be determined. Just yep. because the bankers seldom lose doesn't mean they always win. And this time I'm rooting for us. And I think it could happen. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I really hope this is going to happen and, and that we educate enough people that uh, we could you know, have positive, a, a positive impact on our, on our future because both you and me are still going to live for decades. So we, we want to have a possible, you know, positive future to live in without, you know, this uh, just a blatant corruption and all this stuff going on now. It, it just tears people uh, you know, part and it's really destroys society. When you when you toxify the medium of exchange, you know, you, you create a toxic society, and that's what I think our our outcome is. So, you know, let's really hope for that. Let's uh, just keep on educating as much people as we can uh, about you know uh, monetary uh, edu this uh, education about you know what uh, money could be and having it more decentralized local levels. And I I think that could really save us from you know the the massive fiat apocalypse that will be coming, but you could replace it with these types of system and be less vulnerable, uh, right. you know, at the end of it. So I, I want to thank you, uh, Dave, for taking the time. And it's been a real pleasure. It's been such a long time since yeah. I uh, talked to you last time. So it's uh, fantastic to have you on. And thank you so much, Dave, for uh, okay. spending some time with me. A little self-promotion at the end here. Just go, yeah, if go you ahead. want my free newsletter, just go to themorganreport.com and sign up. It's an opt-in. So it's the Morgan Report. Dot com a first name and an email we'll check your email that you're not a bot and if you're not a bot and click yeah i want it you'll get uh i usually put out about three missives a week and um, there's some opportunities there here and there i do advertise occasionally very rare maybe three four times a year usually at the mining company i know and trust but that's something you can uh, just click through and not pay any attention to it's up to you but uh, a lot of good free material on there so i'll stop with that john and thank you for having me yeah, no, for sure. And uh, all that information, like all your links and everything, we'll put that down below the video. And then I'll uh, make sure to share the video with you when, uh, when it's all uh, put up. So, yeah, good to have you on again. And uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Bye-bye.